All right, hey guys, Nacho, here, two United fans. I am gonna give you my personal guide to being the super cool, most awesome soccer fan that has ever lived. So, you ready for this? You ready? All right, cool. First thing you do is, before you go to your first soccer game, you find yourself a jersey. Any jersey. Like, you know, if it's from like a European team, that's even the best thing, you know, like the best thing. Like, give me, give me one second, okay? I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, this is where it's at. FC Barcelona, La Liga, Andres Iniesta. See, when I wear this at the stadium, everybody knows that I am a sophisticated connoisseur of the best soccer on the planet. And they give me respect for that. So, so, so get your kid on. And, oh, you can't forget this piece. Oh, he's got the scarf. He's got the scarf. You put on a scarf. All cool soccer fans everywhere wear a scarf. Even if you don't have a kit, wear a scarf. You gotta buy one if you don't have one. It's very important. And if you're like me and you've been around the block a little bit, get two scarves. And you can put one around your hand like that and then like... Yeah, 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 whoa, ole, ole, ole. Yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do at the stadium. And no, no, no. And the next thing, this, this, this is, this is, this is a tip only reserved for the coolest of the cool. You see what he did there? You see what I did there? This is ultra, ultra. You are now the pinnacle of soccer fan. What are you doing? Um, what? Is, is that on? The, uh, what is... Ultra! Oh my god. Welcome to Two United Fans with your host, Notch and Kyle. Oh. Hello there. I didn't see you. Welcome to United Fans. I'm Notch. And I'm Kyle. We've got a wonderful episode planned for you today. All you wonderful viewers at home. <laughs> okay, I can't do that. What, what, what have we got lined up for these for good folks today, Kyle? Well, to start off, as you might have noticed, we're wearing some MLS gear. Mm -hmm. I've got my rapid scarf on and wanted to quickly tell you just what MLS teams that we're following. So. I'm a Rapids fan for the MLS because that's where I was born, and really that's about as far as my um, reasoning goes. <laughs> Wait, did, did you like grow up in rural Iowa though? Like, what happens is the Des Moines menace makes it into MLS. My first breath was Colorado air. <laughs> well, I'm wearing Chicago Fire gear because that's the first professional team that I went to watch in the stadium and and this actually this jersey is one of my favorites only because it was when the fire lost Best Buy as their sponsor so for a couple of weeks they were playing with just this stuff on their gear instead of the the Quaker Oats uh, sponsorship that they got later this was also the year that I can manage to convince about six of my friends to go to Bridgeview uh, to Toyota Park it's a nice. big freaking hike, and the fire played a thrilling nil-nil draw, and by thrilling, I mean awful nil-nil draw with the Vancouver Whitecaps, probably the most boring game I've ever watched. None of my friends have been to watch a soccer game ever since. Ouch. Yep, thanks, fire. I really appreciate that. But anyway, we've got a great episode lined up. The first segment that we have coming up is the history of the NASL. We actually filmed this a couple of episodes back, but didn't have a chance to put it out. That episode got a little too long, so we're going to put that out there first. Then the next thing is I got a chance to go backstage with the Denord Football Podcast with Wes and Bruce. So mm -hmm. you'll see some footage uh, of them as they film their episode too, and maybe a little bit more about the history of that podcast as well. But first, let's take a quick break and come back with the history of the NASL. Welcome back to United Fans. Let's start with going back to the year 1997 when we're talking about the history of the NASL. This is way before the new NASL was founded, but we need to start with 97 because that's the year the USISL A League, don't try to remember that, was founded. The, that league existed between 97 and 2004 and was the second division of American soccer. 
Starting in 2005, it was renamed to the USL First Division. That league existed between 2005 and 2009. During all of these years, Major League Soccer, MLS, was the first division of American soccer. Now you're asking yourself, if you're a new soccer fan, what's these divisions that not just talking about? Well, let's go back to the globe and talk about other countries. In most nations, when we talk about soccer, there is a top division and then several divisions below that. The first division, second division, third division, fourth division. As you go down the list, the talent level and the skill of each team decreases. Also, the amount of money they usually spend. Mm -hmm. In most other nations other than the United States, you're also going to find something called promotion and old timers don't groan <laughs> promotion and relegation where teams can move between leagues depending on how well or poorly they do that is not true in the United States so going back to our timeline in 2009 there was something called the USL first division mm -hmm. that was confusingly the second division of American soccer underneath major league soccer and then at the end of 2009, there was this political conflict where a consortium of team owners uh, didn't want the league to be owned by this other company. There was some political conflict. We don't really want to go into it. It's very confusing. Let's not do that. All that needs to be said is there were two con competing groups. So was this consortium of team owners that started the NASL, the North American Soccer League. Uh, a league that was named after a league that had existed in seven, the 70s and 80s, uh, hearkening back to the pretty much the gold, old golden age of U.S. soccer, the NASL. And then you had this other league called the USL First Division, so the existing league, owned by that company that these folks over here objected to. Neither team had enough, or neither league had enough teams to be sanctioned by the USSF. So they were in conflict. And yeah, it's, did your brain hurt yet? I researched this and my brain hurts. Um, it, it is very confusing and it doesn't get a whole lot easier until a few years later. So in the 2010 season is what we're up to right now. And in this year, the USL doesn't have enough teams. NASL doesn't have enough teams either. So the USSF created the USSF D2 Professional League. So this was a league to bridge the gap between the years where they were figuring out what to do with second division soccer in America. Um, after this, in 11, they figured it out. They got it stamped down, and it's what we have today. So the USL added pro to their name because why not? Um, so USL Pro is now the Division Three soccer team or soccer league in America. NASL is now Division Two which is what we play in here. And MLS is Division 1, so it's MLS, yes. NASL, USL Pro. Mm -hmm. So as we learned a little bit earlier here, the NASL is operated by a group of members from its teams. It's owned by all of the teams themselves. And they each have one representative on the Board of Governors. And the Board of Governors is a group that manages all the league rules, um, oversees any big changes to the leagues, but they elect one member to be the commissioner. So Currently, Bill Peterson, very quotable man. Look him up. It's the same as Don Garber, if you're um, familiar with MLS. So think of it on that level. Um, there are a few differences that we do have between the leagues, though, and it's kind of startling between the MLS and NASL specifically. The first one being a split season format. You've got a spring season and a fall season. Those of you familiar with the Mexican League, here's adding a little bit more complexity. Those of you familiar with the Mexican Leagues will find a split season familiar. So the NASL has a spring season and a fall season. Mm -hmm. Each one has a separate points table and you have a spring champion and a fall champion. And previous to this year, previous to 2014, you had the spring champion and the fall champion competing for the Soccer Bowl oh. to be the NASL champion. I have to say, I will miss the Soccer Bowl for what is now called the championship. Um, I'll throw a link below here if I can find it, but you have to go and watch the um, leagues, or it wasn't even the leagues, it was the team's um, promotional video for last year's Soccer Bowl because it is absolutely wonderful. So yeah, check that yes, out. Please hilarious. check that out. 
Well, starting in 2014, what's going to happen is that you have the spring champion, currently Minnesota United FC. Not currently, it should be. It's always going to be Minnesota United FC. And you got whoever's going to be the fall champion. And then the next two best combined records. So you have a combined table with both seasons, points, and games played, and all of that. So the next two best records in the combined table along with both champions so four teams in total are going to compete in what's called the championship which is a four team playoff you got two semifinals and then a final after that hopefully you've seen a graphic on about it on the screen already that's who's going to be the so the, the winner of that four team playoff is going to be the soccer bowl champion the NASL champion at the end of the year and some people might be asking themselves another head scratching question which is what if the same team wins the spring and the fall championship let's not get ourselves the people asking that question right now are minnesota united <laughs> fans stop asking that question it's premature we might not win stop being overconfident knock on wood well, the answer to that question is if the two or if one team wins the two seasons, it just goes down to the next three teams with the best combined record. So it would be Minnesota United and then whichever three teams are below them in the combined table. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned a few big differences between the leagues before, specifically MLS and NASL. If you are familiar with MLS, you know they have a salary cap. You can only spend so much money on players. Now there's a million and one ways you can break that rule and get around it, but that's the general principle they live by. The NASL is completely different in that respect, where there's no salary cap. So if Minnesota United tomorrow decided they wanted to go out and buy Cristiano Ronaldo, they could convince him that he would look just as sexy <laughs> in a parka. They could do it. Okay, okay, okay. If there's any billionaires watching right now, please bring Cristiano Ronaldo to play in Blaine, Minnesota. There is, I don't know the amount of appreciation that I will give you if this happens. Like, that just sounds hilarious. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the biggest differences between the leagues. Um, there are some restrictions that the league does have, however, on what you can have on your team for players. Yeah, so, so the, I think the big one is that you can have between... 25 and 35 players on your roster then you have an active roster of 30 players and within that 30 player roster you can only have seven players who are foreign that is so the u.s team someone who is not a u.s citizen or a u.s permanent resident or for the canadian teams someone who is not a canadian citizen or their equivalent of a canadian permanent resident uh, now, if you look at the Minnesota United Wikipedia page, you're asking yourself, I'm seeing 12 people with a foreign flag next to their name. you got to remember in this case that the FIFA nationality that a player plays for is not necessarily their citizenship. So, Minnesota United Act right now has either seven or fewer than seven foreign players, and we are in compliance with that rule. Mm-hmm. The other thing that we should talk about also is that most NASL teams are in the red. That's the, that means they're not making much money. Soccer teams in general make most of their money from sponsorship and TV deals. The NASL does not have a comprehensive TV deal. Individual teams have deals with local TV stations, mm -hmm. but they're not they're not worth much money to be perfectly honest. And for the most part, and yeah. you have certain teams, <coughs> Cosmos, that have <laughs> large sponsorship deals. But most, again, don't have very large shirt sponsorships either, which is, again, a big source of money. And that does roll over into the players as well, where you see the salaries in the NSL are, as you would expect, if you're thinking of a Division II team, are much lower. In general, most players in the NSL will be holding down two jobs. One, being a full-time professional soccer player. And the second, in, in general, you'll find a lot of coaching jobs but some other way to make more money to be able to live the lifestyle that they want. Um, there are definitely exceptions to that rule. As we talked about with no salary cap, you will find teams who will go out and spend big money for <laughs> Gospels! <laughs> um, Minnesota United, let's be honest. Yeah. cock a doodle -doo, sports fans. I am Bruce McGuire. This is the Do Nord Football Show. I'm Wes Verdine.
Hi, Bruce. Good to see you, man. Um, it's two weeks in a row, I think, with the cockadoodle doo. I know. I've been working on trying to come up with like a catchphrase. Yeah. And it's because you're a secret Tottenham fan. It might be it. Yeah. What were you what reading they have from? to do with chickens? The the the, the, the crest chicken? Yeah. I thought that was like a stork or a rooster. No. Really? Um, yeah. What were you reading? Where the hell did they get roosters that skinny? Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's that's London. The London during the war. That is a skinny Crimean bird. war. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, how your perception of the Minnesota soccer scene might have changed a little bit because of the, the pod? I'm just more famous. Yeah, there's a big head. It's all about me. Bruce. People know that I know Bruce, and that's been advantageous. The one thing I enjoy quite a bit is when I'm somewhere, people always come and ask me about where's Wes. <laughs> what's, what's, what's Wes up to? Um, things like that. And... We're not like best buddies, you know? We get along great. Um, and mainly it's because, you know, if I don't like something, I tell him. If he doesn't like something, he tells me. Uh, I can't speak for Wes. He, I don't take it personal. But um, as far as soccer and all those things are concerned, I just think it's great. I think it's a great place to let people ask their questions. And then, you know, we can fire back our opinion. And all it really hopefully does is start a conversation. I, I don't, I mean, of course I like to think that I know everything, but clearly I, I don't. Yeah, and that's where I come in, because I actually know everything that Bruce doesn't. Um, and that's called how synergy works. I'm going to towel off. Yeah, let's do it. I'll tell you off. So, you guys now, since starting the pod, have had access to some pretty cool people, some, you know, insides of the, of the soccer world. Now, has that influenced the way you see the soccer world or uh, your perception of what goes on in the business of soccer? For me, it has not because most of them won't really tell you wh what's actually going on when you, when you interview somebody. If you interview somebody with a great personality, it's easy to do a fun interview because you can talk about a lot of things. But actual insight and actual facts and actual things that may happen in the future... Good luck getting any of them. Nobody gets those. One of the things that it has put us in proximity to um, to people who we see on TV or, or, or you know who have names that people know, um, and uh, and it, you recognize how small of a world the, the soccer world is. And sometimes I've that's I've been kind of starstruck by that, but other times I've been uh, very underwhelmed by just how um, how kind of Okay. Normal. Oh yeah, how normal everything has been with that, and um, and in terms of the podcast, we we have chances to interview lots of people, but but we don't actually take up most of those opportunities because it's really not about just getting names on the show. It's about who can who can we get on that will tell an interesting story, and so um, you know the the when we want to do those interviews, when it's a, a Jimmy Conrad or even a Minnesota United player, we want to make sure it, it's someone is who we know we can provide a good solid uh, portion of their personality being able to shine. And I'd also prefer to do any interview in person because if you're doing it over the telephone, you, you don't get that, that, that back and forth that uh, you can't feel their energy at all. So you don't really know when to step forward, when to back off, when to, move things to the side, all those kind of things. If you do it in person, usually anybody you can get, you, you can have a pretty decent conversation. And I can play with them, alcohol, them with alcohol at my house, so good point. Can you tell me a little bit about how each episode comes together, or just really in brief, or how you guys plan it out, the notes you might dig, and the segments? We just riff. They got beaten handily by Real Salt Lake, um, former Minnesota uh, player Luke Mulholland name checked Minnesota after the game by the way Did he? on NBC what did he say yes you know I played there and it was great yeah cool. we're yeah. going to MLS Luke Mulholland baby. we just got promoted we got mentioned by an MLS player that's the second time landed on him in the week before yeah what get, more do you want get the hell out of the way yeah Don Garber is if once we get him then it's Beetlejuice 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 three times and we're, we're, in, we're in. incorporated yeah. since Bruce started the the blog he's had his daily, uh, weekly notes that he kind of takes on his own. Um, 
and those create the the bones, sometimes the meat and the skin. Um, but the uh, script, basically. And then, and then I'll um, take take uh, what I watch and kind of what I want to think about, and sometimes I'll email them in advance. But most of the time, I'll just kind of wait and see if I can throw it in, um, and if it if it has no value. But most of what I'm trying to add is um, is seasoning and allowing uh, Bruce to. Uh, pour forth knowledge i try not to get in the way one of our fun one of the fun things that i really love is when we'll start talking before we do the show and one of us will start telling a story or an opinion and the other one will stop them and say save it for the show yeah because that way it's fresh we don't have to try and recreate a conversation that we've already had we get to have it live right yeah. there as it unfolds so we don't even know where it's going there's a lot of like effusive laughter that I give because usually I'll I know Bruce has a story and I don't want to hear it until the show because I I want to have that pure joy of yeah real laughter yeah fear, absolutely it's great I love that stuff kind of the president of the whole umbrella yeah it's basically the way making all the bobbleheads and yeah you know, the Frankie H Hadick uh, chastity belts so, so, for the women around Frankie is that what you're saying the teenage yeah, girls I don't know you, you figure out what, what it's for man but it's got his head on it his face <laughs> Give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Chastity belts, man. I, I love it. You could make a fortune off those guys yeah. and things. I'm oh, there, man. baby. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm picturing this and it's creepy. Yeah. But I got a picture of him up on the like a like a, like the back of an old uh, of an old El Camino shotgun and a cheap beer. <laughs> Wearing a chastity belt. <laughs> I'm just saying on the chastity belt is him kind of giving the thumbs up with a gleam in his eye. Right. Um, Steve. What about the reception that you that it's received? And has it been what it's what you expected? Have there been particular things about the reception that you appreciate or don't appreciate? I have no expectations of where this podcast goes, who listens, who doesn't listen. We've had some great interaction with people because they really dig the show. But for me, it's really never been about that. It's been about them being a fan of the game. I'm a fan of the game. Wes is a fan of the game. And that's all that matters. I don't want to be a host of a podcast. I just want to be another guy who maybe has taken a leadership role in spreading the word, spreading the news, keeping the enthusiasm going. That's why I do it. Yeah, I've, I uh, have enjoyed the the people who say that they think bruce and i hate each other <laughs> there's some someone who said that they think that we hate each other um which we might actually secretly um but uh the reaction i've i've tended to get is that um is just kind of uh that no one feels like even though i am a genius no one feels like i'm unassailable and that they can't challenge me or, or continue and that's kind of fun because because it really is just a place to get conversation started where it's not just shooting from the hip and saying asinine things or just fighting, but that it's a place where we can try to think up, uh, be devil ad devil's advocate to one another. And, and then Twitter and all these places allows people to, uh, to join in that. Well, another big thing for me is going along with just being a soccer fan and, and everyone who listens as a fan is it gives them an opportunity to think, He's approachable. I can go talk to him about the podcast. And all that does is open the door for me to meet another person. I grew up with no other soccer fans in my life until I was, you know, well into my 30s. I didn't know any other real true soccer fans. And so I've always been craving more and more and more, you know, friends in football. And that's what it really gives me the best opportunity to have is just to meet tons of people. And then we can just be fellow soccer fans and hang out and talk and you know, I just, I get a huge rush out of that. One final question I have to ask about the Iron Skillet. <laughs> the Iron Skillet has really taken over and bec become its own beast. Can you just give me a few things about, about how that came about and how you feel about that now? Well, two things I really like as far as being a soccer fan. I like iconography and I like kind of obtuse references. So when I can take those two things and combine them into something that we've literally just made up on the fly, which was Minnesota United having a terrible time on set pieces, and out of nowhere one day I said, you know what we ought to do is get a bunch of us to go out to their training and just literally take to the field when they practice 
set pieces and every time someone makes a mistake we hit him in the side of the head with an iron skillet did you script that or was that on the fly i forget well i mean i, I it was an idea that i thought up and i just okay. went with it on the show okay you know uh and, and and we went from there and it's just become its own beast and so it's obtuse and ridiculous and absurdist which i love but then it's also a strange icon that that can be used in the soccer world and it takes on its own life and and I mean, the day when I was at a game and a guy showed up with a six-foot-tall fiberglass iron skillet, I That's literally cool. got tears in my eyes. Because, I mean, that t-shirt that somebody made was one thing, but to actually make a giant iron skillet, I mean, it's just, it blows my mind that any stupid thing that we think of could take on its own life. The other one being the uh, Batman and Superman for, for, for Miguel Ibarra and, and Christian Ramirez and giving them these nicknames and just running with it. And then one day after a game, you know, Ramirez scores a goal and pulls up his shirt and he's wearing a Superman shirt underneath it. That's incredible. I love that stuff. Well, the, the Dark Cloud section, uh, especially before the, the we were, it was a lot of songs, would kind of come up with just absurdist, stupid songs and chants um, about Kippy the assistant referee or... Or just any anything crazy, you know. You dive like Jamie Watson, um, and so the show has been kind of a, a like little microcosm of that. Where we'll make a few jokes, and some of them will just be funny to us, and then someone will take that idea, just like in the dark cloud section, and it'll suddenly become a virus and just overtake everything. And it's so stupid, and there's something beautiful about something so dumb <laughs> becoming so having having a six foot. Uh, tall uh, fiberglass version of something so stupid is a, a skillet. There's something amazing about that. Yeah.